Hello, everybody, and welcome to Kona Live Online. I think it's hour, I'm not sure, out of 28 hours, 28 hours of continuous online support. So, uh, because this time slot is a pre recorded session for you guys, um, it's kind of be kind of interesting. I'm used to presenting to a live audience and kind of getting that feedback, or at least to a live Zoom. So, here we go there. But thank you guys again for joining us here. I know you guys have a lot of different things you'd be doing, but hopefully, this is going to be interesting. For, for everyone. This session, we're going to talk about one of the new 4.4 features that we have, and it's going to be about hedge reads. So if you see here, you know, in and out of the bleed. So we're going to just kind of get down into some of the details and talk about some of the things and just see what we can dig out. Um, so that takes us to there. So the next thing, here we go. So basically, why am I here to talk to you about this? Well, first of all, I'm for Kona's technical, I'm going to be technical lead. And I've been here since August. Before that, I've worked quite a few other places, um, Bioware Electronic Arts, Object Rocket, Rackspace, um, and then way before that, Van Heim Cox Enterprises. So I've got quite a bit of MongoDB experience from my time at Rackspace, and a lot of different kind of customers, a lot of different types of industries, a lot of different types of applications. Um, there he goes, a little, little aware of this there. So one of the cool things is at Bioware, I worked on Star Wars Day with the public, an MMO game, and it was really, really interesting and exciting to kind of get that out. The last six months kind of joined and worked really hard and got it out. Um, and that was my first exposure to MongoDB during that time. So, but before that, you know, a lot of Oracle, and I really like to work with emerging and disruptive technologies. So which is good because we're in the middle of several of those emerging and disruptive technologies right now, including you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, then AR, VR, MR technologies. A lot of those are gonna take off more and more with 5G, including IoT, sensor data. It's gonna be taking off soon. And then blockchain, smart contracts, and all that type of thing. I also like helping teach and, and girls in STEM, kids in STEM teaching, helping raise people up. So, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started on this particular topic. So hedge reads, Here, here's what we're gonna talk about. What are they? Why they're important? A little bit of architectural overview, read preferences, uh, how hedge reads work, how to monitor them, and then also kind of take a look at some gotchas. All right, so let's go ahead and get started there with this. So what are hedge reads? Well, they're not the bushes that are out there, right? Hedge reads, are going to be hedge and the definition is to protect oneself from losing or failing by counterbalancing action. Example, in gambling, the hedge your bets, also in stock uh, type situations. Uh -oh. All right, and then reading and reads. Well, obviously we're reading and reads, but in computer terms, actions performed by computers to acquire data from a particular source and place it in the volatile memory for processing. Okay, so when we put that together, you get MongoDB hedge reads, and their their definition of this is submitting read requests to multiple replicas and a sharded cluster, returning the results to the client as soon as the quickest note of response. Okay, great, but why do we really care about that? Why Mongo? Would you do that? And that comes into play here. Why are they important to us? To prevent us from crying, right? And we cry whenever we have high latency, if there's slow queries, slow applications, uh, unhappy customers, lost business opportunities, lost sales revenue, revenues. Okay, and gonna go from there. And well, have you ever been irritated by slow websites or mobile apps? Most of us have. You look here, you see the probability amounts that we're talking about. Right, I'm kind of going through there. As your seconds increase, the probability of someone leaving your web page goes up 33% between one and three seconds. Okay, so one and three seconds, probability of bouncing is 32%. One to five seconds, probability of bounces goes all the way up to 90%. That's like over half a point, right? Then one to 6%, the probability of bounce increases to 106%, right? And then you see one to 10 seconds, you know, obviously not that many people are going to stick around for, for 10 seconds. <clears throat> and why is that important even more? Well, because our expectations have changed as we go along. Web website response time, the lack or lag 
It's extremely important when dealing with mobile apps. Okay. Amazon, let's go back there. Amazon estimated that every additional second of page load time costs them $1.6 billion a year. Okay. A Google study, 53% of mobile traffic gone. If you don't respond in three seconds, within three seconds. A 2017 study by Kissmetch, 40% of people will abandon a website if it takes more than three seconds to load. Keep in mind that that's a 2017 study. People's tolerance levels are a lot lower now, all right? A 2019 study, 36% of users will find alternatives if a website is slow. So the average attention span is less than that of a goldfish. Well, apparently we like goldfish now better than we liked um, fleas before. So let's guess goldfish are cured. So going again, just to kind of put it in a more visual way, high latency, lost revenue, three seconds is apparently the magic cutoff point, but again, those figures some people might uh, disagree with. Mobile bounce rates, 53% if the website takes more than three seconds. 40% abandonment, KISS metrics. Slow load times are the primary reason that visitors abandon the checkout process, which leads to lost revenue. How many times have you lost, left a website or emptied your basket because it's just taking entirely too long or because it kept asking the same question. You had to put your credit card information in three or four different times. So you see that's you know problematic, right? So then let's just take a look at this in, the, in some words. One, a 100 millisecond delay in website load time can hurt conversion rates by 7%. A two second delay, that's the bounce rates of 103%. Latency and lag are more important and more noticeable with mobile applications. 53%, three seconds. So not only that, people won't come back to websites once they figure out that they're not any good. There are too many other things out there. So there's a negative perception and it builds onto each other when you put together badly, badly put together websites. And they're not gonna tell their friends about the good, the, them because they're not any good. So it has the multiplier effect, the negative word of mouth. Again, slow load times are the primary reason that visitors abandon a checkout process. And that translates to lost money. But it's not all bad news, right? Because on the flip side of that, if we have for every 100% millisecond decrease in home page load, a customer's base sees a 1.11% lift in session-based conversion. So that's more money. But notice the difference here. You can only get a 1.11% lift conversions for something good as opposed to never coming back for something bad. So, okay, great. So what are we gonna do about that? Consider using hedge reads, MongoDB's hedge reads. Use MongoDB's hedge reads to reduce latency, which leads to faster results. That's getting back to clients, which leads to more conversion, et cetera, et cetera. What are the things that you're looking out for that can be problematic that you're trying to fix? Potential network issues, okay? Latency due to a busy host, slow disk, uh, sync issues that are going on from the primary to, the rep, to, to some of the secondaries. And then the things that you want to do, you want to have more predictable service performance, more predictable latency, allow for better reads to continue in case you have elections or failovers or anything like that. But before we can really talk about how to use Hedge reads, you need to, we need to take a look at that, another look at, at some couple other things. We need to take a look at the underlying architecture really quick and then also the reads. So the underlying architecture, here's a simple, a single replica set, and it's gonna just tell you what we need, because after all, shards are nothing but replica sets put together and a few other components. So here's your primary, and in this case, your two secondaries. You have a heartbeat between them, which keeps basically just keeps them saying, are you live? Are you still there? Are you good? All right. And then you also have your replication that happens from the primary to the secondaries via your op log. Great. So now let's take it up a notch. Sharded clusters. Okay, so here's, here's your sharded cluster. So let's just go through the components again. Obviously down here at the bottom, you have your primary and then your secondary. You, have, you still have your replica sets. Okay, but you just have more of them. A shard is realistically just, just a replica set. Okay.
You also have your Mongo S processes. So your Mongo S are your query routers. You have your application, your, your drivers reside up here in your application. And all of this are connection. And then your configuration files, which is your cluster set, relic set. It's also consists of a primary and two secondaries. So keep in mind that sharded clusters only work with, excuse me, keep in mind that hedge reads currently only work with sharded clusters. Now that's something that they, you know, if, if the demand is here, they're thinking that they may change, right? But let's go back to talking about shards for a second. Shards, so the reason that you shard is so that you can scale horizontally. Your data is distributed across your shards based on whatever you choose your primary key to be. So again, your, your shard key to be, sorry. So your shard key is super important uh, in doing the best job that you can to pick the best one, no matter what. Yes, there's another 4-4 feature called the refinable shard key that allows you to modify your shard key after the fact, but you're still gonna have to worry about balancing and getting everything moved over and balanced and determining the right one and making the changes in case you're having to add a different field to you know, improve the overall cardinality. But shard key selection is a totally different discussion and it takes a lot. So it's better to just take your time and do it right from the beginning and figure out what your best shard key should be. Okay. So the other component that we need to consider when we're talking about this there are read preferences. So read preferences are very important for multiple things, but they are basically going to be interacting with your drivers. All right. So you've got your read preferences, primary, your default mode by, by, obviously by default. So read from the current replica set of the primary. Also happens your multiple document transactions happen there. And then there's a primary preferred. So operations will read from your primary unless it's unavailable for whatever reason, then it can read from the secondary. So hedge reads can occur when using primary preferred. Secondary, all operations read from the secondary members of the replica set. That is what you're setting it to. You set this in your driver or else by operation in your query itself. And that's used often when you have very heavy write applications and you, they're, the, so the primary is gonna be hammered. And so you send your reads off to the, to the secondary. Same for secondary preferred, except going to the secondary, unless there's something not available. And then we have the other, the next one, which is nearest. So nearest, obviously, from a replica set member with the least amount of network latency. So, and with secondary, hedge reads are enabled already by default. So that's a kind of a great thing, so there. So keep in mind that hedge reads can only work for non-primary reads. So. How do hedge reads work? So remember our sharded cluster architecture. Let's kind of go back to that. We're going to use a simplified, overly simplistic view of this. So in this particular example, you have your application and your client drivers in US East. You have your Mongo query router, Mongo S in US East. And then you've got some primary, your primaries in US West and your secondaries. Uh, scattered in various places, for example, U.S. East, U.S. West, London, and Frankfurt. So the closest is determined, and the closest and nearest is determined by the ping time. So it's the lowest average network round trip. So, for example, from the Mongo S and U.S. East to U.S. East secondary, you have a five millisecond time. To the West primary, 15 milliseconds. To the West secondary, 15 milliseconds. To the London secondary, 30 seconds and to the Frankfurt secondary in 35 seconds. Okay. So let's talk about these for a second. Where does that take us? Let's go through the exact process and talk about it. So how hedge reads work? When you're using, again, non-primary read preference, so again, all modes except primary, the Mongo S processes have to have it enabled support for hedge reads. The Mongo S gathers a list of eligible secondary members and it determines based on the ping time, the closest ping time, which one is closest. So the lowest average network round trip time. And then it calculates the latency window based on whatever your, your, your setting is for replication global, local ping time. The default for that is 15 milliseconds. So that's also the default value used in like all of the Mongo V related improved, improved drivers. Okay. So we got this. Once it determines that, it determines, once it determines what the window, the defined latency window is, 
It determines which of the replica set members fit that criteria. From those eligible members, the Mongo S randomly chooses a member, and then it routes the query to that replica set member. If hedge reads are enabled, and we're assuming yes here because we're talking about hedge reads, the Mongo S also sends a second query to the second, the same query to a second eligible member. The second additional member uses the max time MS4 hedge reads parameter. So the default switch defaults to 150 milliseconds. Once the first node returns the results, you've got them. You don't need for the other query to continue running. So it cancels the, the Mongo S cancels the second request. So remember, all available read preference models rely on this. And it follows this kind of secondary procedure, except of course, primary and primary preferred. So again, let's look at the diagram. We can walk through this. The simplistic view again, if you had, you know, realistically, you would have multiple more model S's and the client drive your application servers in different um, data centers as well. So here you have it. Your lowest ping time was five milliseconds, and that's from East, US East to US East. You had your 15 second latency window, uh, your, your buffer, so to speak. So your time here was gonna be 20 milliseconds, okay? As opposed to uh, 15 milliseconds into 15 milliseconds for US West. So those are the two closest. It's gonna randomly send, send it to there. You're gonna assume that it's most likely going to go over here. So it's going to send that out, get the information, and it's gonna return back. So, and then as soon as it gets the return, the, the results are going to go back from US East to US East. And then as soon as it finishes that out, it's going to cancel your US West request. Seems pretty simple. It, it is, but then you have to also remember to factor in all the network type situations. But simple enough, great. Now, how do we set them up? So there are a couple of parameters involved, of course, as with most things related with MongoDB. A couple of parameters that you're going to look at. Yeah, you're going to, Max time MS for hedge reads, like we talked about. This is going to happen in your Mongo S shell. Okay. Um, connected to a run, running Mongo S, and then your DB admin command set parameter uh, there into whatever your, your max timeout is there. You need to enable read hedging mode on the Mongo S processes. Again, the DB admin command. And then your Mongo S is to support hedge reads by default when you have that setting. You want to make sure to use a non-primary read preference. And whenever you have read preference nearest, edge reads are enabled by default. You can also do it here, DB collection, find your read preference, secondary, enable true, and do head at engine. So this can also be said not just at your, your query level, but also at your running instance level. So this is pretty simple to set up there, as you can see. So, okay, how do I know if it's working? Luckily, server status comes to the rescue. We've got a couple of new parameters in 4.4 related specifically to this. And the server status returns for the model being people hedge reads. Non total operations, non total hedged operations, non advantageously hedged operations. So you see how those are defined here. The total number of ops issued with eight hedge reads enabled on this Mongo instance. And then total hedge, the number of all ops that the Mongo instance hedged, that means that it sets the secondary. And then finally, the total number of ops where it actually, the second read, fulfilled the requirement that you're looking for. Okay, so that's all super awesome and great. Um, but as usual with most things, there are a couple of gotchas that kind of come to mind here. And we're gonna look at those now. So things you wanna watch out for, things you at least want to be aware of. Okay. Added load on the host, use of extra resources. If previously you were just going to the primary, then your primary was the one that was going to be seeing all the action. If you were using secondary preferred, you were offloading from, from your primary onto your secondaries for your read. You do that when you have pretty heavily write intensive applications. Okay. The problem with this, when you're using hedge reads, specifically if you're using hedge reads that are in you know, a different data center or, or a different part of the world, you can get stale data. Your read operations for the secondaries may not accurately reflect what the most common data and have the most common updates. So especially if you have some janky network problems and any latency issues, you have a possibility to be there. But it's okay to do that if, if you if that's what you're wanting and that's what you want to be used. All right. 
Let's go back here, keep skipping there. Okay, so still there. Then, for example, if you read from different servers, and it may result in non monotonic reads. So, what that really means, casually consistent sessions. So, various levels of guarantees with monotonic reads. If you're reading from a secondary and it gets behind another secondary, then you could actually end up with slower results and, and different result sets. Um, there's quite a few problems. Basically, in 3.6, they had quite a few issues, and even in 4.2, up to 4.2, they were fixed. Jepson has a bunch of uh, stats and results out there, but this is something that you can just keep in mind. So, but if you go back to also the old notion of eventual consistency, then you should be happy with that. Okay. So when do you not want to use non-primary references? When do, you want to, when do you not want to use secondary or secondary preferred? Basically, when you need the absolute truth of the data, Okay, and you don't want to use secondary or secondary preferred just to provide only for capacity for reads because you're also going to be having some additional read pressure on the machine on the secondary nodes because they're still going to be having to write from the primary the off log changes. So keep in mind, keep that in mind because if it's a capacity issue, then you probably need to be looking at adding more shards and distributing your load horizontally not in doing this particular thing. All right, so distributed read operations. If you're going down, if one of them goes down, then your other, if, you're, if you have, if you're using secondary reads and a member goes down, then your other members are gonna have to take up the slack. And the other thing is when you're doing this, if you have any elections, if you have any failures, all right? So that's, that's kind of just a really quick overview because this was meant to be a tape session we're going to be having a, a, some blogs coming out um, around this and around a couple of the other new features, but this gives you just a quick overview. So they're definitely something to consider, especially if you have latency issues, and those are things you want to look at. All right. So for Honda, what we do, here's what we do for Mongo specifically. MongoDB software tools, the team of experts, professional services, managed services, software, flexible offerings. We have our open source Percona distribution for Mongo, which includes a Percona server for MongoDB and the Percona, Percona backup. And we also have PMM, Percona monitoring and management, and then Kubernetes operators. Okay. So thank you guys very much. Again, this 30 minute session. Um, didn't have time to go through real results, but I'll have those coming out. And I appreciate you guys too, taking care of this. Um, thanks and welcome to Percona.